What is wave impedance? I'm going to explain and try to visualize the concept of impedance as if it was a sequence of events, even though all this is happening simultaneously and it's technically incorrect to explain this as a sequence. But first, let's apply an oscillating electric field to some medium that has an impedance. That's a little bit strange to say because all mediums have impedance. The vacuum of space, for example, has an impedance of 377 ohms. Usually the impedance of things becomes slightly less than that, like 200 or 100 ohms. I have to point out that the concept of impedance applies only to the electric and magnetic field components of the same wave. If there are multiple waves and they're all overlapping, we can't look at the totals of the electric and magnetic fields and imply impedance to that. We have to somehow isolate one of those waves, the electromagnetic field components of that one single wave, and then apply impedance to that. After that electric field is applied, there's an interaction with the charges at the atomic scale, and there's also coupling through Maxwell's equations. And all of this combines to make the medium respond with some oscillating magnetic field. And electromagnetic waves, they always have an electric and magnetic field component because it's a coupling of energy between those two through Maxwell's equations that supports waves. So the magnetic field can have, and usually does have, a different magnitude and phase than the driving electric field. I will say usually the phase is very, very small, the phase difference between those two, but the magnitude is quite dramatic. They're about three orders of magnitude different. I think it's also a little bit incorrect to think that the magnetic field is smaller than the electric field. It's a bit like comparing apples to oranges. Electromagnetic fields are different things and have different units. So don't think that way, but numerically, the magnetic field is usually about three orders of magnitude smaller than the electric field. So the magnetic field and electric field can be different through magnitude and phase. The impedance is what quantifies that relationship. I tend to think of the impedance like a scale, and it's balancing E and H. But it's a complex number because it's describing the difference in the amplitude and phase between the electric and magnetic fields. Let's look at the definition of wave impedance from a mathematical perspective. We'll start with the expression of the electric field component of an electromagnetic wave. Now we know that there's also a magnetic field component and it has the same exact form. And I'm writing that over on the right. The difference is it can have a different complex amplitude. So that's magnitude and phase. And it's also a different direction than the electric field. So the electric field, the magnetic field and the direction of the wave K, these are all perpendicular to each other. So we define wave impedance as the ratio of the complex amplitude of the electric field to the complex amplitude of the magnetic field. So we divide those two and we get impedance. And as I mentioned briefly before, I think of impedance as sort of a scale and it's weighing the electric field and magnetic field. The only thing about that analogy is that it really doesn't account for phase. That maybe makes sense for the magnitude, but not so much phase, but it's still the picture that's in my head. Now to jump ahead, the impedance of a medium, it will turn out is the square root of the permeability divided by the permittivity. And these are not the free space terms or the relative terms. This is the total permeability and the total permittivity here. Let's very quickly show how to derive that expression for wave impedance. So we start with Faraday's law and we substitute into that the expression we had for the electric field component of a wave. So we substitute that into Faraday's law. Now from there, let's solve this for the magnetic field H. And we arrive yet at a new equation. From there, we can recognize that the magnitude of this wave vector is omega times the square root of mu times epsilon. So in the first equation here, we had this wave vector. We can write that as the magnitude of the wave vector multiplied by a unit vector in the direction of K. 
So that's actually what we have here. So the magnitude is omega times the square root of mu epsilon. And then the direction is this normalized wave vector here. And I'm indicating this normalized unit vector by the caret over top instead of the arrow. Now from there, we can recognize, hey, these omegas cancel. And there's also two mu terms that will cancel. And we arrive at the final expression here for the magnetic field in terms of the mu and epsilon and the complex amplitude of the electric field. I'll take a moment to point out here this cross product. The K and P unit vectors, they're guaranteed to be perpendicular to each other because electromagnetic waves are always transverse. That means the magnitude of this cross product is just one. So this cross product is not going to be affecting the magnitude or the complex magnitude of the magnetic field. It's only going to affect the direction. And of course, the direction from the properties of a cross product that will be perpendicular to both K and P. So K, P, and E are all 90 degrees with respect to each other. But it's important to understand, since these are both unit vectors, that this cross product is not affecting the magnitude of this magnetic field. The magnitude will be completely controlled by these terms out front. At this point, we have two expressions, one for the electric field component, and now we have an expression for the magnetic field component, but in terms of the parameters from the electric field expression. So let's identify the complex amplitudes of both. Well, on the left, by definition, it was E naught. But on the right, the complex amplitude is the E naught times the square root of epsilon divided by mu. And we're guaranteed that that's the complex amplitude because we mentioned on the previous slide, this cross product is not affecting the magnitude of this. So that complex amplitude is what previously we had called H naught. Now back to the definition of wave impedance. It's the complex electric field amplitude divided by the complex magnetic field amplitude. Well, we now have an expression for the complex magnetic field amplitude in terms of the complex electric field amplitude. So we plug both of those in and we end up here. Those E naughts cancel and we end up with the final expression for wave impedance, square root of mu over epsilon. While we have this math going, the last thing we should do is think about how the impedance affects the magnetic field relative to the electric field. So we have this expression now of the magnetic field in terms of the complex electric field amplitude divided by the impedance. And remember, the cross product is not entering into or affecting the complex amplitude. So since the impedance is a complex number, we can write it as a magnitude and a phase. Sometimes this is called polar form of a phaser. So we'll simply just replace this complex impedance with the expression in the sentence above. And so we're dividing the complex amplitude of the electric field by this polar form of the complex impedance. Then the last thing we can do is combine those complex exponentials. Now we see what the two parts of the complex impedance does. The magnitude is dividing the complex amplitude of the electric field. So the magnitude of impedance is affecting the magnitude of the magnetic field. The bigger the magnitude of impedance, the smaller the magnitude of the magnetic field compared to the electric field. Then what happened to the phase term? Well, when we bring it up here, we see that this is subtracting phase. Now, in practical situations, this phase is usually small and it arises due to loss or conductivity in a material. That's beyond what we're talking about here, but the electric and magnetic fields can be out of phase in general. Here's a nice visualization of the effect of the magnitude of impedance. So we have a status bar here at the upper left that's telling us when impedance is large or small. When impedance is large, the magnitude of the magnetic field becomes smaller. That's because the magnitude of the magnetic field is the complex amplitude of the electric field divided by the impedance. And likewise, when the magnitude of the impedance becomes small, then the magnitude of the magnetic field becomes larger relative to the electric field. 
Here is a very similar visualization, but now we're changing the phase. We're keeping the magnitude of impedance fixed and we're changing the phase. And in the middle here is actually zero phase. So as the status bar goes below that, we're talking about negative phase. And as it goes above the middle, we're talking about positive phase. And so we can see that the phase of impedance is affecting the phase of the magnetic field component of this wave relative to the electric field component. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for using EMPossible. I want to create more videos and I want to continue to improve how electromagnetics and computation is taught online. To do that, it will really help me if you can like this video and subscribe to our channel. I also want you to know we have a lot more content that you may not be aware of. See everything we have to offer at eimpossible.net.